altruism, ethics, corporate responsibility. These are the words that Sam Bankman-Fried hid behind as he used his $32 billion business as a personal piggy bank. The ethics thing, just a front? A journalist asked. Yeah, he replied. He, he. League of Legends. Imperial Chinese harems. Amphetamines. These aren't just random words. They all appear in this story. Great. People aren't taking me out my word in, and I understand that. FTX, a cryptocurrency exchange, was valued at $32 billion in early 2022. At that time, founder and CEO, 30-year-old Sam Bankman-Fried, was seen as a crypto genius with a passion for altruism. He was one of the youngest billionaires on the planet, with a peak net worth of $26 billion. His crypto empire had two main components. FTX, a crypto exchange, and Alameda Research, a hedge fund. He was born on the campus of Stanford University in 1992. His parents, Barbara Freed and Joseph Bankman, were both professors at Stanford University's School of Law. His aunt, Linda Freed, was an academic in medicine, who would eventually become Dean of Columbia University's School of Public Health. His brother, Gabriel Bankman Freed, was a Wall Street trader and director of non-profit Guarding Against Pandemics. Much of the following background information is from a puff piece commissioned by an investor, a piece they later took down, surely out of embarrassment. But it's worth talking about for reasons which will become clear later. Bankman Freed attended Crystal Springs Uplands, an elite prep school in California, which the Wall Street Journal has called one of the world's top 50 schools for preparing students to enter the most elite universities. In 2010, he started college at MIT, where he studied physics and was considered highly gifted in mathematics. He joined a co-ed fraternity called Epsilon Theta, known for being super geeks who love debating math, physics, philosophy, and computer science at alcohol-free parties. Cosmic. During his time at MIT, he met an Oxford-educated philosopher, Will McCaskill, who introduced him to a philosophy called effective altruism. McCaskill explained that if one's goal in life is to be a force for good in the world, the best way to accomplish that goal is by making as much money as possible for the purpose of giving it away to others, specifically the poor. Effective altruism is especially popular in Silicon Valley. Bankman Freed was quite taken with the concept, as his parents had already raised him under the philosophy of utilitarianism, which argues that one should engage in actions that result in the greatest amount of good for the greatest number of people possible. In talking to McCaskill, Bankman Freed discovered his purpose in life, to become filthy rich. For the sake of charity. How noble. In 2013, at the suggestion of McCaskill, Bankman Freed got a summer internship at Jane Street Capital, a New York high-frequency trading firm that does trillions of dollars worth of securities trading each year. After finishing college, Bankman Freed got a job at Jane Street, where he did very well as a trader, and gave away 50% of his income to the Center for Effective Altruism and 80,000 Hours, two organizations funded by Will McCaskill. He also befriended another trader at Jane Street named Caroline Ellison, who was also into effective altruism, or at least said she was. She is the daughter of Gregory K. Palm and Sarah Fisher Ellison, both professors of economics at MIT. Ellison got a degree in mathematics from 
Stanford. During Bankman Freed's time at Jane Street, he felt that if he really wanted to get really rich in order to help the poor, he would have to take bigger risks than just working at a Wall Street firm. So he started thinking about other career paths. He thought about being a journalist, <laughs> or running for office, or maybe creating a startup. He ended up deciding to leave Jane Street and go faff around in San Francisco for a while to figure things out, and ended up getting a job for Will McCaskill at the Center for Effective Altruism. Lucky he knew him, huh? At this time, crypto was becoming all the rage in the tech world, and Bankman Freed started looking into it. He noticed that Bitcoin was trading for higher prices in Japan and Korea versus the US, but making the trades was difficult due to issues involving red tape. So he invested $50,000 of his own money and created a company called Alameda Research. He recruited a grad student in Japan to set up a Japanese banking account that would be willing to process crypto trades. The spread between Bitcoin prices in Japan and the US was about 10%, meaning he could make money by buying Bitcoin in one territory and immediately selling it in another. He made trades on a daily basis, quickly compounding his $50,000 investment. At the time, the total daily trading volume of crypto was about a billion dollars, and Bankman Freed wanted to capture 5% of that market. So, he went looking for a $50 million loan. Jan Tallinn, the co-founder of Skype, and another acolyte of effective altruism, agreed to front most of the money, and they began making serious profits. Next, Bankman Freed enlisted the help of one of his brother's friends, Nishad Singh, who quit his job at Facebook and came to join Bankman Freed's company. About six months after Bankman Freed arrived in San Francisco and started Alameda Research, Caroline Ellison was sent to San Francisco on a recruiting trip for Jane Street Capital and decided to catch up with Bankman Freed at a coffee house where she was dressed as a wood nymph because she was on her way to a LARPing party. Jesus Christ. Bankman Freed told her about his new company and she decided to leave her job at Jane Street a few weeks later to come and work for him. The first 15 employees of Alameda, including Ellison, lived and worked together in a 600 square foot apartment, and they gave away 50% of the company's profits to charities associated with the effective altruism movement. Just in case you're not familiar with feet, that's about 0.033 square nautical miles, or the surface area of eight snooker tables. Regulation, of course, not bootleg. Over time, the spread between Japanese and US Bitcoin prices began to shrink down to nothing. So in 2019, Bankman Freed decided to use the millions of dollars of profits made by Alameda to develop a new cryptocurrency exchange, FTX. He moved the company to Hong Kong, which was friendly toward crypto trading, set up shop, and began looking for additional investors. This is where venture capital company Sequoia Capital came to the rescue in 2021. In a Zoom meeting, one of the Sequoia investors asked Bankman Freed about his long-term vision for FTX, to which he replied, I want FTX to be a place where you can do anything you want with your next dollar. You can buy Bitcoin, you can send money in whatever currency to any friend anywhere in the world. You can buy a banana. You can do anything you want with the money from inside FTX. The investors were blown away and thought that FTX was going to be the future of money itself. Later, it was revealed that Bankman Freed had been playing League of Legends throughout the entire meeting, which he was apparently want to do. Sequoia Capital learned of this, but apparently weren't bothered. I'd say it was a red flag. Nevertheless, soon FTX had raised $1.5 billion from investors, but they had trouble operating in Hong Kong, 
because of strict COVID-19 restrictions. So they moved the company again, this time to the Bahamas, where COVID restrictions were much more lax. By this time, in 2021, FTX was becoming a powerhouse in crypto trading, the second largest crypto exchange by market share. Caroline Ellison was made CEO of Alameda Research, though it was still owned by Bankman Freed. The core group of employees who ran FTX was comprised of 10 people, including Bankman Freed and Ellison, who were all between the ages of 28 and 35, and all lived together in a $40 million luxury penthouse in the Bahamas. FTX was worth $18 billion by July 2021. Two months later, it was worth $25 billion. Bankman Freed's personal net worth was over $22 billion by Q4. They pulled out all the stops and advertising, spending $135 million for naming rights to a stadium in Miami. They made a deal for an undisclosed amount with Major League Baseball to put the FTX logo on umpire uniforms. They paid for celebrity endorsements from Larry David, Tom Brady, Giselle Bunchen, Shaquille O'Neal, Stephen Curry, not that one, and Naomi Osaka. Bankman Freed went to big events where he mingled with politicians and celebrities, like an early 2022 crypto conference in the Bahamas that cost $3,000 per person, where he shared a stage with Bill Clinton and war criminal Tony Blair. He also became a prolific political donor. In 2022, he gave more than $10 million in contributions to Democratic candidates and PACs, political action committees, including $5 million to the Future Forward PAC for Biden's election campaign. He was the second largest contributor behind George Soros. Bankman Freed gave $800,000 to the Democratic National Committee. 1 million to Chuck Schumer's Senate Majority PAC, 6 million to the House Majority PAC. In the 2022 midterms, he gave a total of 39.9 million to Democratic PACs, including one that he helped start himself, the Protect Our Future PAC. Two of his executives at FTX gave an additional 29 million. He gave some money to Republicans too, but much less a $2 million contribution to a crypto-focused super PAC called GMI. His family is involved in political fundraising as well. His mother is the founder of a super PAC called Mind the Gap, which raised $140 million in the 2022 midterms. Bankman Freed also started a non-profit called Guarding Against Pandemics, which lobbies for pandemic preparedness and is operated by his brother, Gabriel. In addition, in March 2022, the Ukrainian government set up a crypto donations website, Aid for Ukraine, with the backing of FTX. On September the 22nd, 2022, a profile on Sam Bankman-Fried was published on the website of Sequoia Capital. Sequoia commissioned a Silicon Valley journalist to go to the Bahamas and interview Bankman Freed and write a puff piece entitled Sam Bankman Freed has a savior complex and maybe you should too. It's an incredibly long, incredibly ass licking article and refers to Bankman Freed as possibly the world's first trillionaire. This is part of a recent trend with tech companies and their investors who have found that media companies and real journalists have become quite critical of big tech startups in wake of major scandals like the Theranos fraud. In short, companies like Sequoia are creating corporate propaganda to show how these big tech founders are amazing geniuses who are going to change the world. Less than a month after the article was published, Sequoia would quietly remove the piece from their website. Because... On November the 2nd of 2022, the crypto news website Coindesk published an exclusive where they looked at the balance sheets of Alameda Research and found that a majority of its assets were comprised of FTT, the 
the crypto token issued by its sister company, FTX, rather than using an independent asset like a fiat currency or a third-party crypto. In other words, the majority of Alameda's net equity was comprised of the crypto token that their own sister company controlled and printed out of thin air. It was also revealed that Alameda possessed over $7 billion in loans. In short, it looked like the company was facing a liquidity crisis. This revelation caused users to panic about whether the company might be insolvent. This sparked a wave of withdrawals from the exchange, basically like a run on a bank. A few days later, on Sunday, November the 6th, a rival exchange called Binance announced that they would be dumping their $529 million worth of FTT tokens, resulting in even more panic. By that night, FTX had received $5 billion in total withdrawal requests from customers, and the price of FTT began to fall dramatically, from about $24 per token to $17 per token. Two days after that, on Tuesday, November the 8th, Binance turned around and said they intended to buy FTX in its entirety after performing some due diligence, and this helped calm some of the industry panic. But within hours of checking the books at FTX, Binance discovered that the Coindesk report was true, that Alameda's balance sheets were packed with the FTX coin, FTT. The next day, Wednesday, November the 9th, Binance officially announced they were backing out of the deal. Around this time, FTX users were complaining on Twitter and Telegram that they were having difficulties withdrawing their funds from the exchange. As it turned out, FTX had paused all customer withdrawals, something that has happened right before other crypto crashes in the past. On November the 10th, the Wall Street Journal reported that CEO Bankman Freed told investors in a meeting that FTX had lent not seven, but ten billion dollars to Alameda using customer deposits. FTX had a total of 16 billion dollars in customer assets, meaning they had lent 62% of all of their customers' money to Alameda. In traditional markets, Brokers must keep client funds separate from other company assets. Just a few days prior, amid questions about the health of the company, Bankman Fried had tweeted, FTX has enough to cover all client holdings. We don't invest client assets, even in treasuries. He deleted that tweet one day later. Later, on the 10th, the Securities Commission of the Bahamas, where FTX is incorporated, announced they would be freezing the assets of the company's Bahamian subsidiary. The same day, Bankman Freed announced that Alameda would begin to wind down trading. Then, on November the 11th, 2022, around about 10 a.m., Bankman Freed announced on Twitter that FTX and its 130 affiliated companies, including Alameda, would be filing for bankruptcy and that he was resigning as CEO. By this point, a lot of the damage had already been done. Bankman Freed's crypto empire, once worth $32 billion, had dropped to about $1 billion in value. Replacing him as CEO would be John J. Ray, an expert in corporate restructuring who had previously overseen the bankruptcy of Enron. As this was happening, the Securities and Exchange Commission and the Commodities Future Trading Commission were launching a probe into the collapse of FTX. That same day, around 9.45 p.m. Eastern Time, crypto enthusiasts on Twitter began posting about some unusual transactions on the blockchain, showing that millions of dollars were being pulled out of FTX wallets. Some of these transactions were encoded with mysterious messages like rug pull. By midnight that night, over $600 million had been moved out of the wallets, and an administrator on the official FTX Telegram channel sent out a mysterious message, saying that FTX had been hacked and warning users not to go on the FTX website 
as it might download Trojans. The next day, November the 12th, users on Twitter were speculating that the hack had been an inside job. Nick Pococo, the chief security officer of a different exchange called Kraken, tweeted that this was under investigation, and shortly after, tweeted again, saying they knew the identity of the account. A spokesman from Kraken told Fortune magazine that they had frozen a handful of wallets that appeared to have received the stolen coins, and were working alongside FTX and law enforcement to determine the origin of the hack. So far, as of the time of writing, no further information has been released about whether the hacker has been positively identified. The damage from all of this, the bankruptcy filing, the revelation that FTX was misusing customer deposits, the hacking of millions of dollars, has been catastrophic. As of the writing of this, the FTT token is valued at about $1.50, down from an all-time high of $85 in September 2021. Needless to say, the internet has been in a frenzy over this story. People on Twitter were playing where in the world is Sam Bankman freed, trying to track his private jet, because don't you know that all altruists have private jets? According to most sources though, he currently is still in the Bahamas, being closely monitored by authorities. Which authorities? I'm going to guess all of them, but definitely the Bahamians and the US DOJ. The Department of Justice is investigating and says that Bankman Freed may be extradited to the US. The House Financial Services Committee has announced a congressional hearing, which is expected to take place in December, and the top lawmakers of the committee have said they expect Bankman Freed to be there. It's worth noting that there are strange connections between Caroline Ellison and the SEC. Her father, Glenn Ellison, used to work alongside Gary Gensler, current chairman of the SEC, at MIT. House Representative Tom Emmer tweeted that his office has received reports alleging that Gensler was helping Bankman Freed and FTX work on legal loopholes to obtain a regulatory monopoly, and that his office would be investigating. It's also come out that Ellison wasn't just the CEO of Alameda, but that she had an on and off relationship with Bankman Freed. Online rumors are swirling that the two of them and the other eight people living with them were part of a polycule, or a group of people engaged in polyamory. That doesn't sound like a very good working environment. Ellison appears to have written some very strange blogs on Tumblr in 2018. One called World Optimization, where she goes by the name Fake Charity Nerd Girl. The page contains a link to the author's Twitter page, at Caroline Capital. She seems to have a preoccupation with race science, polyamory, and hierarchical rankings of people. Also, bragging about being on speed. The blog was recently deleted, but still exists on the good old Wayback Machine, as well as a website that has compiled all of the posts. Rumours, and I stress that they are just rumours right now, our Ellison is currently in Hong Kong, trying to flee to Dubai. Have you seen this wood nymph? Arrest on sight. Bankman Freed is keeping a low profile in all of the... No, no he's not. A reporter named Kelsey Piper from Vox posted a conversation she had with Bankman Freed in his Twitter DMs on November the 13th. He said a lot of weird shit in that conversation, but the most important part is where she asked about all of his talk in the past about ethics and whether it was a front. His response, yes. He also stated that ethics is, this dumb game we woke Westerners play where we say all the right shibboleths and so everyone likes us. He also admitted that FDX loaned customer funds to Alameda because he thought Alameda had enough collateral to reasonably cover it. This is just how the world is. I'm corrupt, 
and dishonourable, and I'll say anything that needs to be said, because all that really matters to me is money. And because I lack self-awareness, and I am a total narcissist, having been born into great privilege and wealth, and having only ever rubbed shoulders with people just like me, the rest of the world must be like that too, right? Like, no one's trustworthy. Everyone who says they're honourable, they're just saying that, that's just branding. That is quite a sad world, isn't it, to exist in? I mean, you don't speak for us, dude. Fuck you. <sighs> the conversation ended with Bankman Freed explaining that he regrets putting FTX into bankruptcy and that his current plan is to try and raise $8 billion to save FTX. Like, dude, first of all, you're not the CEO anymore. You're out of the company. Second, you've just admitted to lying to your customers, investors, and the media. You've admitted to breaking the law. It's over. You are probably going to jail. In a court filing on Thursday, November the 7th, John J. Ray, who is currently overseeing the bankruptcy of FTX, said that this case is one of the worst he's ever seen. And again, this is Enron guy. Enron guy, Mr. Enron. He details how FTX didn't keep proper accounting records, used corporate funds for real estate and personal items for the executives, used unsecured emails for communication of sensitive information, and used chat applications that would delete messages automatically. Ray said, Never in my career have I seen such a complete failure of corporate controls and such a complete absence of trustworthy financial information as occurred here. But the signs were always there though, weren't they? Is it really surprising that Bankman Freed et al. never believed in anything other than themselves, but knew to say the exact opposite in public? Really, it would have been surprising if he was genuine. The cryptocurrency market itself has been crashing in the last year, going from a value of $3 trillion in 2021 to about $827 billion today. But it's not over, not yet, just keep holding. Sure, beanie babies are worthless now, but the universe hasn't ended yet, it could go back up. And what if aliens come down and give us a matter replicator? Won't matter then, will it? Print me a martini, or you, why not have two, it doesn't matter, sure. Just print it out of air. See? Optimistic. I'll have five million quamsars, please. To the moon! Well, there you go. In light of recent comments, this isn't something that the vast majority of people need to hear, I'm sure, but it's worth saying anyway. I don't care about race or gender or orientation or belief or anything. If you're corrupt, I'll go after you. That's it. Thanks very much for watching. I have a Twitter. You can follow me there. See how long that lasts. I have a Patreon. You can give me money there. See how long that lasts. I have a Facebook. Why bother? Again, thanks very much. Don't let the bastards grind you down. Cheerio. Now I'm going to eat some Natty Daddy. It's the solid form of Natty Ice. But ice is solid. There's not one bit of ice in any of those cans. Right, congressman. Who's my congressman? Oh, I know who it is. It's fucking Mitch McConnell. Right, well, I might as well not bother then.